All right, so I'll start with introductions before I do screen sharing and then we'll have to do the whole thing and can everybody see this and that kind of stuff. So apologies for that coming up. I know we're probably all used to it now, um, but um, my name is Jess Stillman Rainey and um, I live and work as a white settler in um, the ancestral lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and Sioux people, which is so-called Denver, Colorado. Um, I identify as a mad and suicidal person. Um, those are really core parts of my identity, um, along with being a, a queer person and being white um, and sort of femme. Uh, I, I'm really attached to sort of femme identity, I think. And um, I wanted to just do a brief visual description and then um, I'll talk a little bit about um, why I do this work and we'll jump right in. So um, I am like a fat white femme presenting person. I have uh, round glasses on their black and white kind of tortoise shell. Um, I have reddish hair uh, that's like a bob type thing. I'm not really sure how to describe hair. I always do it badly, I think. And I'm wearing this mustard yellow, like fake leather jacket thing. Um, and I have tattoos on my chest that are the moon tarot card. I tend to talk with my hands a lot, so you'll see them involved, and I have tattoos all over uh, my hands as well, and wear rings on all of my fingers because it makes me feel safer. Uh, so uh, those are things that I do to, to present better. Um, in the background of me is an office with a plant and a picture, a painting of a chihuahua with giant glasses on, so um, it kind of represents my personality a little bit, I think. Um, I have worked in suicidology and sort of crisis um, uh, and, and um, queer spaces for my whole career. Um, so crisis is really kind of central to the work that I've done and I've done crisis work in lots of different settings. Um, as a person who experienced crisis and experienced systems in some really, really negative ways um, that included things like police contact and forced treatment and forced drugging and um, you know, seclusion and restraint and things like that, uh, it's really important to me to start looking at ways that we can respond to crisis um, a little bit more effectively in our communities in ways that are healing and supportive and keep people in community instead of in ways that um, are punishing. Um, so the way I like to talk about this is to really look at history of how did we get here and then think about what would a liberatory practice look like um, if we're going to sort of um, let go of those historical things or find ways to repair history. Um, what does it look like to do this work in more effective ways? Uh, so that's going to be the kind of focus of the presentation. Um, as far as content, I think it's just useful to know that we're going to talk about um, some things like psychiatric hospitalization and psychiatric abuse. And we're going to talk about suicide and self-injury um, and diagnosis um, and the you know, use of force as, as a method of treatment. Um, we're going to look at things like asylums a little bit and sort of the history there. And we're going to talk about the connection between queerness and madness, um, which um, that, what that has been made throughout history. And there, these are things that can be painful for people. Um, so I just wanted to recognize that those are parts of the content that we're going to have and people should do anything they need to to take care of themselves as we're exploring this. So I will go ahead and do the screen share. All right, how are we doing? Can people see? Yes, you're good okay. to go. Thank you. All right, so um, we're going to talk about liberatory responses to crisis, suicide and crisis. Uh, I'm Jess Stolen Rainey, which we already talked about. My approach today um, is going to be addressing the connection between deeply personal and deeply political issues. Um, while dignity is paramount in liberatory work, I think the history is not a dignified history. And so we're going to talk about sort of both of those things. Uh, we're going to center experiences of people marginalized by the mental health system. We'll focus on self-defined health and wellness. We talk about liber liberation. And then we want to honor his so social and cultural factors that impact experiences. So I want to talk a little bit about feelings. Um, 
my feeling when I talk about all of this is that if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. Um, and that might not be how everyone feels about it, but I'm expecting that folks will have some emotional responses. I want to just note that emotions are not inherently bad or good things. Um, we can have emotions that maybe don't feel as good or don't or, or feel uh, worse than others, but um, they're not inherent. They don't mean something inherently about the person who's experiencing them. Emotional responses to injustice are normal and welcomed in this space. And emotional responses about mental health are nor normal and welcome in this space. Um, so I wanted to just invite us to sort of share a space where we can have emotional reactions to these very personal and very political issues that we'll be talking about today. For our agenda, we'll be talking about the carceral history of crisis response, the targeting of queer and trans people in this response, the carceral, le carceral legacy and current responses to crisis, and then imagining what liberatory responses might look like. So we'll start with the carceral history of crisis response. Um, so we're gonna talk about madness, irrationality, and the um, a sort of impetus to act in people's best interest. And I'm gonna put best interest in quotes because I don't think that's much of what has happened. Uh, I'm gonna frame this around carceral responses to disability. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, throughout a lot of history, um, both uh, psychiatrist people and um, physically or, or um, otherwise disabled people were sort of lumped into the same um, same group and treated similarly. Uh, so I'm gonna just talk about it from that framework to start out. Um, so the, the history of um, coercion is always a discussion of power. The history of um, mental health treatment is always a discussion of coercion. And I wanna be, be clear that we're really talking about um, sort of white um, Western approaches to this because that is what has sort of dominated the approach, the systems approach in the United States where we are, um, we are doing our work or at least um, Michael and I are doing our work. So um, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody came from somewhere else here today. So in the 16th century and before mad neurodivergent and disabled people lived on the fringes of society, there was uneasiness about um, this idea of madness, people talk about, people talked about, um, you know, mad people having dark secrets and having apocalyptic visions. Um, and they were really pushed out to the outsides of society. So people were left out of communities. From there, there was a great confinement. So instead of pushing people out of communities, we brought them into communities, but into a carceral setting. So people were going to be, um, there was gonna be a focus on discipline and separation. Um, we were gonna really work on putting people into a space and separating them from society. So you would have families you know, dropping their mad, neurodivergent, disabled family members off at asylums and places like that, um, uh, that and then never seeing them again. And so that was, that was really where people went. And oftentimes these places were both places where criminals were housed. I'm going to put criminals in quotes as well. Uh, so where criminals were housed as well as um, where we were placing um, people who had experiences with madness. And then these spaces became kind of medicalized. And as they became medicalized, we started to see some movement toward deinstitutionalization. And um, medicalizing it meant that we started talking about the experiences people were having as illnesses as opposed to things like um, being possessed or um, uh, other ways of understanding people's experience with crisis or mental, um, what gets called mental illness now. Um, as soon as we started medicalizing, then we could treat, um, you know, using an illness framework. And the, the benefit to society of treatments and cures, um, when we're looking at this in terms of power, the benefit is that people can rejoin the workforce. Uh, so a lot of this medicalization was driven by a workforce need is that we wanted people to be able to come back into um, society and be part of our workforces. Um, so a lot of the things that got defined as well really got defined around ability to work and ability to work within um, really specific sort of capitalist structures. Um, and so you'll see, you see this legacy still today. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, being able to work is always can kind of considered an indicator 
of mental wellness and struggling with work is considered an indicator of mental illness. And then we saw some moralization happening. There's been moralizing in the past as well. Um, but you started to see things like psychoanalysis emerge and, and this idea of sort of like um, brokenness and moral failing. And so um, you saw places like um, the religious institutions um, trying to respond to madness in some different ways than medical institutions did. So um, both of those things were sort of happening at the same time. And what evolved out of that was um, a risk management approach. Um, so this is kind of where we are now is that we manage risk. Um, so we're looking at who is the most at risk to experience disability or death um, and then, and, and, or who might be damaging to um, maybe things that are considered peacefulness or community or society or property. Uh, so those, those kinds of things um, are, are really the focus of how we define mental health and, and mental illness now. Um, interventions started being talked about as um, things that are for people's, for their own good. Um, we started really thought, starting to talk about um, prevention and you started to hear about things like imminent risk. Um, so we're defining risk ar around a time frame, um, and that's how we were able to have carceral responses and this still exists today. The slides aren't moving. Oh, okay. Got it to work. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that we've seen is sort of as a, in a history of psychiatric oppression um, is that psychiatry has been used to uphold white supremacy and cis heteropatriarchy. Um, it's done that by diagnosing resistance. Um, so we've had, uh, there have been diagnoses for people who uh, resist um, in political ways all throughout um, the history of psychi psychiatry um, from the times of slavery. There were all kinds of different um, diagnoses that were um, assigned to enslaved people who, who um, were not um, practicing or being, being enslaved like properly. Um, that were um, that we still have legacy of today. Um, there were diagnoses like protest psychosis that actually still get um, used. Um, you might hear uh, you might hear about these things even still um, when you're looking at uprising people being um, committed to mental health facilities instead of being arrested. Um, we also saw criminalization of disability. Um, so the criminalization of disability, like. Um, if people are having experiences with uh, disabling experiences, aren't able to own homes, things like that, we've criminalized their experiences out in public. Um, and then all of these have, uh, all of the responses to suffering are carceral. They always involve being removed from society, pulled into an institution and having to prove our sanity in, in order to leave. Um, and I wanna specifically look at suicide and the way that that happens. So, um, Suicide and rationality are sort of set up as um, diametrically opposed. These are things that can't exist, coexist for a person. A person can't be suicidal and be rational. Uh, so the way that we've developed this understanding is that um, we started with the idea that sanity is better than insanity, that we privilege sanity over insanity. And it means that sane people are given power and control in our culture. This also means that they get to define what is sane. So they get to define for themselves what is sane, um, and they usually define that as people like them. Um, these definitions often become more strict over time because that's how you um, preserve intersectional power. Um, so these definitions tend to get more and more strict. Sane people then get to define the reality for others. So one of the privileges of sanity is defining reality. This is called epistemic injustice. And it happens in two ways. First, there's hermeneutical injustice, which keeps us from accessing the tools to understand our own oppression. So this might show up as things like being instructed not to read about your own diagnosis or not disclosing treatment plans to um, a person who's receiving services. The second kind of injustice is testimonial injustice, and it casts us as inaccurate reporters of our own experiences. So same people then get to define the reality um, that enforces both of these. 
Um, there's this idea then that sane people want to live. And because sane people carry privilege and the most privileged among them get to define our reality, wanting to live is ascribed to sanity. It's not that surprising that people with a lot of privilege often want to live because um, they're the most likely to experience the world in ways that feel good. Um, and so it's easier to survive when things feel good. Um, because we've decided that same people want to live, um, then there's this idea that we should prolong life at all costs. Since same people place more value on the desire to live, they can also create mandates around pro prolong prolonging life. Um, and that's what we see in most imminent risk statutes. So then that, now that we've established all of that, we can establish that wanting to die is insane. And so because wanting to live and prolonging life are attributed to sanity, Wanting to die is therefore insane. And under this par paradigm, the desire to live or die is divested from external systems of power. So we're not recognizing why living in a world that was never designed for us might make us want to die. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about then instead is that um, this, pro this is a problem that's located inside individuals. So there's no responsibility on systems and all the responsibility is on us as individual people for experiencing thoughts of suicide. So then when the desire to live is, is common among people who are called sane and uncommon among mad people, we can call it pathological. Um, and then we can also call it pathological when you see experiences with suicide clustering among specific groups, um, which happens with queer and trans people. If we believe that wanting to die is insane, then we can justify wanting to intervene or that we must intervene. So if wanting to die is a flaw in reasonableness and rationality, and the value is to prolong life at all costs, we are charged with intervening. This is the foundation of suicide prevention. It is deeply rooted in sanism and it's deeply connected to carceral approaches. So then if you are, if you are someone who attempts suicide or someone who's been suicidal, um, when you've survived that, you have to perform thankfulness in order to be able to leave carceral settings. So because sane people define reality and the reality says that sane people want to live, the only way to pass a sane and avoid coercion is to prove our sanity through thankfulness um, and a good survivor narrative. So it's this idea that I thought that things were really bad. Now I understand everything that I thought, everything I thought was wrong can be fixed and I have the power to change my own life. And so we have to sort of perform this good survivor narrative in order um, to, uh, to leave restrictive settings. This further validates a system that is built on power and access, not the reality of people's lives. Um, we haven't ha even have a term for people who do not have insight, and we put that in quotes, into how mad they truly are. That's anisognosia. And we do not buy into, uh, when we do not buy into the good sur survivor narrative, so um, I had this experience, um, when we don't buy into the good survivor narrative, when we want to die despite interventions to save our lives, then we are told we lack insight and that pathology must be treated to make us become more sane. Something's wrong. Someone needs to fix us until we're not suicidal anymore. Instead of we need to fix the world so that it's a worthwhile place for people to live in. All right, so we're going to move into the specifics targeting of um, queer and trans people and how um, madness and queerness have been linked. So I'm gonna look at um, some, some history. I'm gonna choose big blocks of history. It's really hard to move through um, history effectively. And so I know these are huge blocks of time and I'm, I'm really being reductive, but I wanted to just give some ideas. Um, so lesbian, gay and bisexual identities during this time period were characterized as pathologies um, associated with um, psychopathy and criminal behavior. Um, trans identities were considered sexual pathologies at this time. Um, frontal lobotomy and electroshock shock therapy were the recommended treatments for queer people. And queer people were banned from entering the country um, and from the military um, because they were considered dangerous because of that association with um, psychopathy and criminal behavior. Um, from 1946 to 1970, um, trans identities became, became more associated with psychopathy. 
the DSM categorized um, homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disorder, and then later as a, a personality disorder. Um, pharmacological aversion therapy and electroshock therapy were the recommended treatments for queer and trans people. Then from the 70s into the mid 80s, um, sodomy laws were repealed. Queer people became represented more at the APA. Um, and some activists worked to increase protective factors in the queer community, but all of that stuff was kind of still hanging on. Some of those perspectives were still kind of clinging. Um, in the present, you know, homosexuality has been removed from the DSM, um, which is a good thing. A don't ask, don't tell. Compromise was later repealed. The APA condemned conversion therapy supports marriage equality and second parent, parent adoption and sodomy laws have been ruled unconstitutional. And so these things are all true and um, there's a lot of stuff that still is remaining intact. Um, people are still being subjected to conversion therapy um, uh, and, and conversion therapy is that like a, is not a, a really appropriate term but that's the term that gets used, um, used by the people who, who um, implement it. Um, but there, there are lots of these treatments that still kind of hang around and exist um, and are left as a part of a legacy. Um, so the carceral legacy and current crisis response um, is here. So um, this legacy, um, I wanna start with some of the data. So uh, the data is that we have higher rates of anxiety, mood and substance use disorders. I'm gonna put that in quotes because um, I think there's some things to challenge about the way the DSM and the medical model thinks about mental health. Um, um, suicide, uh, so those, uh, all of those things and suicidal thoughts are reported among people ages 15 to 54 um, with same-sex partners at higher rates than um, their peers. The leading cause of death among queer people ages 10 to 24 is suicide. Between 40 and 80% of trans people attempt suicide in their lifetimes, depending on which survey you're looking at. Um, most of uh, and and there haven't been that many um really there haven't there hasn't been a lot of great research um around trans trans people and suicide um conversion therapy is still legal um uh, between 60 and 85 percent of queer people in treatment have lied to their therapist about their experiences because of fear of discrimination um queer people are three times excuse me two three times as likely to struggle with harmful substance use and five times as likely to struggle with harmful alcohol use as their straight and cis peers. Um, and I think harmful is a complicated, uh, complicated space to talk about, but these are, this is data from um, current national surveys. Um, there are no national standards that require mental health providers to receive any training about the unique needs of queer and trans populations, um, gender confirmation, surgery, hormone therapy, therapy, et cetera, require mental health diagnosis and treatment for insurance coverage. Um, queer people are twice as likely as their straight and cis peers to engage in disordered eating. Medicare and Medicaid require that people receive a diagnosis to qualify for treatment. Um, there's also state sanctioned coercion kind of across the board. Um, and so this state sanctioned coercion happens in three different types of settings. And so that's State, uh, danger to self, danger to others, and grave disability. Um, what is complicated about these is that these three situations are rarely defined. They are interpreted wildly differently by different providers and from organization to organization, even clinician to clinician. There's mass confusion about the differences between the instances when clinicians are able to break confidentiality and write a mental health hold and mandatory reporting, which is an entirely different standard. Um, because our society is so litigious, clinicians are put in positions where they have to decide if they're willing to risk their license um, to, um, to not use state-sanctioned coercion or if they're going to use coercion kind of liberally um, as a way to protect themselves, which actually doesn't protect them. So this forces suicidal people, people in extreme states, people hearing voices, having visions um, into a risk narrative in which they can be considered dangerous or a liability. And this is how therapists are trained to think about the people that they're serving is how dangerous are they? Um, if we're always creating the standard of danger and risk, um, then we never really get to talk about mental health in other ways. 
This stuff is not limited to involuntary treatment either. We see things showing up like coercion shows up as the threat of involuntary treatment, pressure from family, access to basic needs um, is contingent upon participating in different kinds of treatment. Access to other things we want can be contingent on participating or, or medication compliance, things like that. Um, safety plans and contracts are used often and, and we sometimes are not able to stay uh, free from coercive or restrictive settings unless we are willing to make a safety plan or sign a safety contract. Safety contracts just um, for, uh, for so people know, um, have a lot of evidence that um, they actually increase people's risk for suicide. So safety plans are slightly different, but a lot of agencies still use contracts. Um, sometimes people have a lack of other options, so they're forced into coercive environments because there's, there's nowhere else to turn. Um, there's pressure from providers. So sometimes you'll have a physical healthcare provider who says you really need to access mental health support. I actually had this happen recently. I um, need to get an MRI uh, related to migraines. Um, and because I have a, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, my um, the first doctor I talked to um, told me that I I might actually just be having um, some like uh, effects of, of schizophrenia and that we needed to get me on medication first, um, which is like not an accurate way of engaging with uh, with a neurological issue, you know. Um, there's social incentivizing, so. Um, we often focus so much on behaviors and their impact on others and it moralizes madness as something rude, disruptive, or shameful. Um, and so then we, we feel like we have to use um, or invest in coercive environments in order to um, be less of a problem for society. Um, and then we also might engage in these things because of punishment avoidance. Um, so all, I think all of that stuff um, sort of creates this environment where you can see the legacy um, of this, um, of these bad interventions, of these carceral interventions um, in our current systems. So what I wanna spend the most time on is um, imagining liberatory responses. Um, liberatory responses are things that help us identify and meet our community's needs um, and I think they start with, um, you know, when we think about our work in this space, it always is going to start with reparations. And that's um, reparations by these carceral mental health systems um, to people who have been harmed by them. And reparations don't just have to be monetary. At the very least, they should include public acknowledgements of things that have gone wrong. That's sort of the baseline. Um, this could also include public assistance for people who have been harmed by coercive interventions reimbursement for lost wages, lost abilities, et cetera. Um, it could include access to free, higher quality mental health support of people's choosing. Um, there are lots of ways to consider reparations. Uh, we can also depart from um, positivism and empiricism. So valuing other ways to come to know um, what it means to be suicidal, what it means to be mad, what it means to be queer, and what is helpful for us in these moments is that Maybe some kinds of science are not the best way um, or the only way to come to know. We want to divest from um, pathology and understanding mental difference uh, through the societal or through the social model of disability instead of just pathology. Um, this would mean that people are not psychiatrically disabled because of anything internal to them, but by a society that was never built with us in mind. I think it's helpful also to de decentralize behaviorist measures. So oftentimes um, wellness or success or success of a treatment is defined in terms of people's experience, um, in terms of people's behavior changing and not in terms of people experiencing feeling better or navigating a world, the world in a way that works for them. Um, it's all sort of based on, are you attempting suicide still? Um, are you experiencing um, disruptive behaviors to society still. Um, and that's not really a good measure of people's individual experience of wellness. Um, so if we're only using that measurement, um, we're, we're never going to um, create pathways for people to live in a world more, um, more truthfully um, for who they are. 
We want to center lived experience. So lived experience should be, um, the lived experience of people impacted by these systems should be um, the evidence that we need for whether or not they're working. And also they should be leading um, the next steps in what, what we want to do. We wanna focus on moving toward things that we want instead of away from things we don't want. We spend a whole lot of time um, in mental health work and especially in crisis talking about how do we keep you from killing yourself? How do we keep you from having crisis again? Instead of saying, what do we want your life? To, what do you want your life to be like? And how do we move toward that? Um, and, and then that creates a space for people to have a life that includes madness and suicidal thoughts and can still be good. Um, and then shared power. So power doesn't exist solely within provider, um, providers and sort of clinical systems of care. Um, power should exist in, in the places, um, in, in both in the people accessing services and in those providing them. And ideally those lines start to disappear a little bit. So some, some examples of what this might look like. Um, would be peer support services. Um, so really accessible peer support services in a community um, that people can access when they're in crisis. Ideally, they would be 24 seven. Um, ideally, there would be lots of options and ranging from uh, sort of telephonic and text and chat all the way through um, being able to stay somewhere for a while, like affirming peer respite care, um, which is sort of the second one. I think really divesting from 911, so finding ways of, of responding to crisis and emergency that don't include law enforcement specifically, um, but also other kinds of healthcare um, interventions can actually be pretty traumatic for folks as well. And so how can we help people access what they need emergently or when they're in a crisis without having to contact those kinds of services? Um, so it's like building something new. Um, and putting less money toward those, those systems that aren't helping. Um, creating mutual aid networks um, that maybe provide these services, but also mutual aid networks can do a whole lot of other things that I think are really powerful. Um, mutual aid networks can look like things like pill shares. They can look like um, showing up, um, someone showing up to your home to care for you while you have a crisis and then um, you know, staying for a few days and leaving. It might be practical assistance, like bringing you food or um, giving people money um, when they need it, things like that um, all can happen within mutual aid networks. Um, vetting providers is a really important um, sort of a process to go through. So in our communities, how do we create um, sort of something like a survey or a checklist so that we can vet providers and people know what they might be getting into when they go to someone? Um, and so I think this is, this is more than just like a Yelp review kind of system. Um, I think it's really um, about showing up and like giving, doing, when, when we do an intake, say for mental health treatment, um, we should be interviewing providers just as much as they're interviewing us. And if they won't answer your question, you don't need to um, go to them. I don't think that they're a good provider for you. Um, like I, I won't go see anyone who won't answer questions for me um, about their use of restrictive interventions, when they think it's okay to hospitalize someone, when they would call the police, all of those kinds of things. And then if you are a care provider, um, I think that there is an important role for, of law breaking. Um, civil disobedience is about not honoring laws that are bad laws, laws that are harmful to people. And I think it's very, very clear that a lot of the mental health treatments that happen in coercive ways, um, the mental health holds, things like that, are bad laws. And so um, as, uh, as a, a group of people who are trying to engage in liberatory practice, we can be lawbreakers intentionally pr uh, practice civil disobedience. Um, I think there's lots of strategies for that. Um, and there are lots of, um, lots of people who are actually doing that already. Um, but um, sometimes people can feel like having a license or working for an organization means uh, that their hands, are, their hands are tied, that they're not able um, to engage in different ways. But um, we can make those choices. And historically, people have. This is how movements have happened. So um, I think those are, those are all some practical potential examples. Um, I have a lot of resources on a last slide, and I'm also going to drop 
a PDF into the um, the chat uh, so that you all have a PDF of this presentation. But what I wanted to do next was sort of open up some space um, for some questions for a little bit and to talk about what liberatory responses may look like um, in, in your area. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share for a minute to try and catch up on um, some questions in the chat and then um, please put stuff in there if there are things that you would want to want me to address. This is Laurie Cook Daniels from um, Forge. I have not seen any questions in the chat that we've not already answered. Oh, wow, okay. And I just wanted to pop in and say that if folks would like to ask more anonymously, you can use the Q&A um, feature, which will allow you to ask in a, in a more private way. Um, I know that um, there was a question about grave disability, and I know it was answered by one person, but would you like to respond to that, Jess, about what your definition is of grave disability? Yeah, so each state is going to define it slightly differently, but basically it's um, a per when a person is not able to make decisions for themselves, but it has to be based on because of one of two things. One, because of a mental, what, um, what gets called mental illness, or um, it has to be because of their substance use. And it's defined slightly differently in every state. Um, but basically, um, people can, uh, either family members or other folks can petition um, for grave disability or an assessment can happen. Um, because they're accessing other services. Um, and so uh, this this also, um, this is not the same as um, people who are having other experiences outside of mental health and substance use. Like there are other ways that um, people can lose control of their life, but this is specific to mental health and substance use. Um, so I think Susan Stefan has a book called, um, gosh, let me make sure I'm getting the name of the book right, um, Rational Suicide, Irrational Laws, that I think has the best, um, sort of addresses the, the laws around suicide and reporting the most effectively. Um, it's a really great book. I highly recommend it, especially if you're a provider. This is Larie Cook Daniels again. I do have two questions now. Great. Can you say more about testimonial injustice and her medical injustice or resources to read more about these? Yeah, yeah. So there is a really wonderful book called Epistemic Injustice uh, or Epistemic Justice. Um, and it talks about, and it's, it's the book that defined all of this. Um, so Epistemic Justice is, um, the idea that we can be, um, so epistemic injustice is that we can be unfairly discriminated against in our capacity as knowers um, based on a prejudice about the speaker. So the prejudice can come from gender, social background, ethnicity, race, sexuality, tone of voice, all of those things um, can cause epistemic injustice. Um, and uh, so the author of that book is Miranda Fricker. Um, it's a huge book. There are lots of other places. You can just do some Googling about epistemic justice. Um, but the, basically the two types are um, that either you are not able to access information about your people. Um, so that could be you're left out of history books. It could be um, you don't know who your people are. It could be um, that you're being intentionally denied access, like in a mental health treatment setting where they're like, I don't think it would be therapeutic for you to know your diagnosis. Um, all of those things are um, the ways that we get denied access to information about people. So like these, a lot of these laws that are popping up right now um, about queer and trans people are really explicitly going after that, um, that type of epistemic injustice. Um, what they're looking at is trying to make sure um, that people can't have information about themselves or other people like them. Um, the other kind is testimonial injustice. So testimonial injustice is when um, we are, are not tr uh, trusted as accurate reporters of our experience. 
Um, and so what that means is um, we believe that someone else can define that person's experience more accurately than they can. Um, so this is often linked to um, experiences with madness. So, you know, if someone is um, considered psychotic, what gets called psychotic, um, then their experience of the world is automatically not true um, or automatically less true than other people's around them. Um, and while, you know, they might experience things that don't align with consensus reality, people who are experiencing the things that get called psychosis very often do have experiences with abuse um, or other, other experiences that they absolutely know are true and nobody believes them. Um, and so once you're not once you're not um, an accurate reporter of your own experiences and you don't know who your people are, your history, or anything about people like you, then you can be controlled really easily um, by society in different places, like in, within almost any institution. Okay, the floodgates have opened, so we have a bunch <laughs> now. All right. Uh, and one I'd like to pick up now, although it's not the next one, is um, can someone write the name of the book in the chat? I didn't catch it the one recommended for providers. Rational suicide, irrational laws. I'm about to type that in. Okay, great, thank you. And then let me go to the next question, if you can um, multitask. Yeah. Uh, can you speak more to the difference between safety planning and safety contracts? Yeah. Um, so safety planning, um, and I think really specifically collaborative safety planning, um, is a, a practice that someone might engage in um, either as a crisis worker or a therapist um, when someone is um, experiencing suicidal thoughts or, or all kinds of other thoughts, anything that brings risk. So we're gonna make a plan. Um, ideally that plan is something collaborative you do together um, to deal with that risk when it comes up. Um, so it's going to include things like distractions that you can use. It's gonna include um, people you can call, um, when you would call emergency services, things like that. So um, safety planning has some, some evidence base. Um, you know, it's, it's been most primarily studied in environments when people are leaving hospitalizations after attempting suicide, um, but it gets used in lots of other, lots of other places. Um, so, uh, so safety planning, that's planning. Safety contracts are gonna be, um, so this is, I've seen this really commonly at colleges and universities. Um, you, you go to a therapist, you talk about suicide and they're like, I'm gonna need you to sign this document that promise, says you promise not to kill yourself. Um, and if you think you're going to, that you'll go call 911 or go to the emergency room. Um, and those were really designed as like, um, basically tools to like uh, not have to be subject to litigation. Um, what's interesting is because we know there's evidence that they actually increase people's risk of dying by suicide because people then don't want to tell their provider when they're thinking about suicide. Um, and they don't want, they don't access support when they're thinking about suicide. Um, safety contracts actually increase the risk of litigation for, for providers. Uh, but people think that they don't. They think it's a, a shield. Um, we, I have another one here. As someone with an LCSW, I would love to hear more about how to challenge mandatory reporting laws without risking my license and employment. I saw that Ida shared a link, but just curious about the potential impact on a licensed mental health professional. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the likelihood of being sued by family members after a person dies by suicide. Um, and so mandatory reporting does not apply to suicide. It's about, that's about abuse and neglect, um, just to differentiate imminent risk and mandatory reporting are, are different. Oftentimes people are not taught that they're different, but they are in the law. Um, so imminent risk, we're talking about imminent risk, the likelihood that a provider would be sued um, by a family after a client dies by suicide is about as common as being struck by lightning. Um, 
for a peer, a peer supporter, if you're that, that's the work that someone does, um, it's, it's very unlikely because a peer has never been sued um, for working with someone who died by suicide. Um, so, so I think that's a good place to start is that um, I think there's, um, there's a perception that there's much more risk around this stuff than there actually is. Um, I think most of the time, what we think is a law is actually gonna be agency policy. Um, I think there's really great strategies for challenging agency policy that include printing off the law, putting it next to the agency policy, and then talking about why are we making choices that are different from this, um, which I think can be a really great advocacy tool. Um, I think there's lots of ways of engaging with your uh, clients that will open up space for you to explore things a little bit differently than that, than with them. Um, what's most important when you're working with someone suicidal specifically is that you document why, um, why you're making the decisions that you do. So good documentation that shows that you did stuff with them, that you worked with them, you supported them, and that you cared about them. Those are the two most important things um, to shield yourself from litigation, if that's the concern. Um, I think that it's worthwhile for providers to consider unionizing and then challenging those components of licensure. Um, if you think that that component of licensure is flawed, which I would I would say it is, um, I think you should unionize and make sure that it doesn't isn't part of that. Um, I think that. You know, if you're a, if you're a social worker specifically, self determination is supposed to be one of your ethics, and these laws don't line up with self determination. Um, so there's a pretty pretty solid reason for NESW not to support this as a part of licensure. Okay, I have another one. I would love if the speaker could share any info on being a physical or mental health provider who has a mental illness is mad particularly as regards disclosure requirements to apply for medical licenses, et cetera. I have deliberately not sought licensure in certain states due to questions on license applications. Yeah. Yep, I am, I am really explicitly have not pursued a mental health license um, at all um, because, uh, because that's not a situation that I wanna be put in. Um, I think that we have decisions to make as mad people um, around this stuff. Um, it is really important for people like us to be able to provide services to, to our peers, right? And it's important for us to be able to do that as peer supporters. And it's important for us to be able to do that as other types of providers. Um, I, I would not recommend disclosing um, if you're going to pursue licensure, if that's part of their, if that's part of their, um, requirement uh, because because I think that they'll discriminate against you. Um, I'm in a position where um, I am very out as a mad person, so I could never get a job anywhere where nobody where someone wouldn't know um, already. So I'm, I'm kind of in a different a different space with that. And I made a decision um, several years ago that I was um, you know I was doing a lot of research in suicide prevention. I was really, really scared of people knowing about specifically about my, that I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, because when you are someone that doesn't always share consensus reality, then um, that um, testimonial injustice is a, is a really common experience. And I thought people wouldn't trust me as a researcher. And I wasn't wrong about that, but I did make a decision to sort of come out in a big, big way at a conference. Um, Cause I never do, I never do anything in like a, small, small way, I guess. Uh, so I sort of blew the doors open on that. And then um, there's no turning back for me. Um, I think it matters for some of us to be public and, and to talk about things in the way that I do. I also think it matters for some of us to be um, accessible and discreet um, to people because while we're in the process of trying to change the systems as they are, we also have to work within the world we actually live in. Okay, next one. I have a hard time with people who do want to go inpatient and then because they are not actively planning to end their lives, they are gatekept. 
I see this as a major issue because it makes inpatient or higher levels of care only for those who are close to death. Yeah, I think this is like one of the biggest flaws. I talk about this all the time um, with, especially in the suicide prevention world, is that we are like constantly pushing these like surveillance tactics where we can find the suicidal people and like involuntarily treat them. And there are people literally begging for services who can't access them. Um, so I think just, just starting there, if we were looking at trying to reform our systems, um, just starting with trying to not, um, not reserve them for people who are being forced into treatment and really open up space for people who, who want it, um, would be really helpful. One of the problems there is that inpatient hospitalization, whether it is, uh, voluntary or involuntary and whether it is for the purpose of, um, suicide, uh, suicide prevention or not, um, does increase people's risk for suicide across their lifetime. And then also within that first year, the first two weeks following hospitalization, people are extremely high risk to die by suicide. Um, so what we really know is that like hospitalization doesn't work very well for many people, um, for a lot of things. Oftentimes what people find helpful in the hospital is not about the hospital or the treatment they get there. It's about having a break, having a home, having a consistent schedule, um, having people to support them with basic needs, um, being around people who are like them, uh, those kinds of things. So there are other settings where we can replicate that. Um, and I think investing in those would be a really helpful option as well. So that's why I think about things like peer respite or even just respite, clinical respite care could even be better um, than hospitalization tends to be. I am going to skip some that uh, was crosstalk within the chat and go to the next question since we have so many questions. All right. I've heard people say that having gender dysphoria in the DSM is a good thing because that means HRT and surgeries can be covered by insurance. However, the obvious downsides. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, that's, I mean, so it's complicated, right? Because the way that insurance Basically, insur we, I think we all know insurance is a scam, right? Um, so, so insurance is a setup where you have to have a diagnosis to get treatment for it. Um, and I think that there are, um, there are potentially other pathways. There are a lot of people who know a lot more than me about this, so I don't want to speak too much on it, but I think there's other pathways um, to have insurance cover things. Um, and I think one of the things that, uh, one of the ways that we can look at is some of the way pregnancy gets treated. Um, oh, and I think I see someone in the chat who wrote that now. So they probably know more about that than I do as well. Um, but um, we could look at um, some different ways of conceptualizing that so that it's not um, sort of framed as like a mental illness and is, is instead um, just about um, accessing care that people need to affirm their identities. This may be the last question, we'll see. Um, Arlene says, I published an article on gender dysphoria diagnoses. I'm happy to share with you. The goal is to get it in the ICD so it becomes like pregnancy mm -hmm. in the sense that it can be quote unquote treated, i.e. one can access hormones and surgery, but without a pathological diagnosis. Gender dysphoria is much better than GID was, but still a long way to go. Um, Ari, people are asking if you can give a link to that article. Did you want to comment, Jess? Yeah, I think that's, um, I think that article is definitely going to be um, much better and more articulate than I can be about it. Um, so, uh, so I would love for people to have access to that and I would like to see it as well. Okay, well, that is the end of the current question. So I'll turn it back to you. All right. Well, I'm going to just share my screen um, and talk about some potential resources um, that people can consider um, as they start building alternatives in their communities. Um, so let's see. Here we go. Looks like that's working. Okay. Um, so I think uh, there's a, a book called Suicide, Foucault, History and Truth by Ian Marsh that I think is really useful. Um, when I drop the PDF in here in just a moment, um, all of these links are hyperlinked so you can go straight to those texts. Um, 
Critical Suicide Studies Network is a really useful resource. Rational Suicide or Rational Laws by Susan Stefan, which we already talked about. Decarcerating Disability by Liat Ben Mosh is really wonderful. Helping the, the Suicidal Person by Stacey Friedenthal. Um, Defund the Police slash Invest in Community Care by Interrupting Criminalization. Vicki Reynolds has really great works on solidarity teams, um, which is a, a great source for providers to start thinking about practicing differently. Um, T.L. Lewis has an article called Disability Justice is an Essential Part of Abolishing Police and Prisons. Um, suicide and Agency, Anthropological Perspectives on Self-Destruction, Personhood and Power by Lydek Ross and Daniel Munster is wonderful. Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice by Leah Lakshmi, Yepsina, Samarasina, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but I'm trying. Um, and um, Elliot Fuqui has a website with really wonderful resources, um, including a guide called How to Survive the Apocalypse. That's a mutual aid guide that I think is excellent for people to try out. And then Abolition, a Journal and Community of Radical Theory and Practice um, also talks about other, other resources to consider um, for crisis intervention. Um, so those are the resources that I have for all of you. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions if more are popping up, um, but I'm gonna switch off of sharing and drop in the link or drop in the um, PDF for everyone. We do have another one. All right. I agree with this. As a nurse and a certified case manager, we believe in autonomy. I empower my clients at every turn, but feel so much pressure at my agency to force treatment on them that they don't want. Thank you for the information you have provided. How do you deal with clients with persecutory, I don't have that, uh, hallucinations who are at risk for eviction? These are surrounding the neighbor. Happens everywhere we move him. Did you understand it even though I couldn't pronounce it? I I sure did. This is oh, this is such a hard question. Um feeling targeted and afraid is um feeling targeted and afraid causes people to uh to behave in all kinds of ways. I think you probably everyone has experienced this feeling before. Um the intensity of the feeling and the duration of it can um can really impact our behavior. Um, it can cause us to behave in ways that feel erratic to people around us um, and scary to people around us. And um, oftentimes these um, perceptions are not wrong, right? Uh, so oftentimes people who feel like they're being targeted, who feel like they're being watched, probably have been in some different ways. And um, it can be because um, being publicly mad causes a lot of people to pay attention to you. It could be because you know you access services that use surveillance systems. Um, it could be because you've been incarcerated before, and those those surveillance systems that follow um, are are really really are watching people. So having this experience is not does not mean that someone is like not not having experiences rooted in reality. Um, it's oftentimes that their fear has become bigger than some of the experiences that are happening because they've experienced it so much. Um, I think that having connections in community is like the best way for people to work through that feeling. And oftentimes people are cut off from community pretty intentionally and significantly as soon as those things happen. Um, I, um, on our, I run a peer support line in uh, Colorado, and one of the ways that we really talk about approaching folks who are having these experiences is um, to really talk about what what safety would mean to them, sort of negotiating what safety means, starting to explore what that would look like, um, and so defining that first on their terms. Um, I find it really useful for us to assume that people's behavior always makes sense and people are always seeking safety. So that doesn't mean that we don't, we know why their behavior makes sense or we understand it, um, but, uh, but it does. And so if we can approach people as if like they, their behavior makes sense, this makes sense to me, it's fine that you're behaving this way. I understand, I, or I will try to understand with you. And I understand that what you're doing is trying to find a way to be safe. 
um, it opens up a lot of possibilities for us to talk through what's going on with people. So, so that's generally my approach, but I don't know, um, you know, it's, it's really hard because we have systems that are set up for people having that experience to end up back in jail or to end up in hospitals. Um, and so resisting that is really challenging. Yeah, a little bit extra um, information was put in the chat. He has been incarcerated and he's fired nine support yeah. workers. Yeah, and right. And so like, this is a fear that's rooted in something real. And the more people don't believe him or the more people push back against that fear, um, that's right. That's the, that testimonial injustice is not being believed. Um, and the less people believe you, the more, um, the more intense that fear becomes and the bigger our behavior gets in response. Having someone who just shows up and really just believes him that his experience is real would probably make a big difference. Okay, another one. Do you have any thoughts around how to have conversations with fellow members of the LGBTQIA plus community who are okay with participating in forced coerced interventions when someone is suicidal? It's been a hard place of disconnection for me and community. Yeah, I, I typically find that people who are having, who have that perception, um, who believe that uh, force and course of interventions are okay, um, oftentimes it's because they have an experience of loss that was really, really awful and really scary. Um, so I have had a lot of, um, it's been really helpful for me to sort of identify what is underneath that. So like, where, um, where did you, how did you come to know that this was an okay way to intervene? Um, and then being able to sort of talk through, talk through that. So like what happened with, with this person that you lost? Um, how did you see systems fail them? What did you want? What would you want systems to do instead? All of those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, I think from there, it can be easier to have discussions about, you know, what if there are other possibilities for how we could intervene that don't require force and coercion that we, we know actually lead to higher rates of suicide. Okay, um, I have skipped um, a bunch of things that say things like, yes, yeah, so good. So there's <laughs> lots of good feedback in the chat that I haven't repeated for you. You'll have to go look at it yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks, Laurie, for reading the questions out because it's, sometimes it's hard to read all those and, and be focused as well. So um, Jess, I know we've got, um, we technically have 20 more minutes. Yeah. Um, and we might be at the end of the questions, like Larry said. Um, are there things that you would like to add before we close out? Um, I think the thing that I would add was when, it, when we think about suicide specifically, um, if there's anything that, that is magical and works for people, it's connection. And anyone can do that. Anyone can connect with people. Um, so building strong communities, building communities where um, we don't have to like each other to be a part of the community where we don't have to be our best selves all the time to be a part of the community and where we're going to take care of each other um, and pull each other in closer when something bad happens or when people are behaving in ways that are hard for us. Um, that's the thing that keeps people from dying. That's the thing that keeps us from losing each other. And the mental health system doesn't do that for us. Your insurance company doesn't do that for you. It's the, the community that you build. So this is something everyone can work toward. Um, and, and it's hard world building is hard work, uh, but it's also the nicer part of revolution, right? It's the nicer part of activism, um, uh, because it doesn't require dismantling everything and tearing things down and, um, law breaking. It just requires us to learn how to be with each other and then create something new. Um, so I encourage people to focus in that space. If the other stuff feels overwhelming and intimidating, that's the place to go. I so would excellent. love to end on that note, but I do have another question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Do you know of any resources or support groups for providers with mental health diagnoses? Um, I actually run a support group for uh, suicidal people who are providers, um, which I can, um, let's see. 
I don't have a good, I don't have a really easy link to that because it's kind of, I'm like, Michael, if I send you some information about it, can you send it out to participants? Totally, yes. Well, cool. yeah, I run a group that's called Alternatives to Suicide and it's a mutual support group. Um, so I, so I know of that one, um, and we meet twice a month, uh, first and third Mondays, I believe. So I would love to see more of you there. Um, it's a really, really lovely space. Um, and just the, um, there's no cost. It's a free group. Um, yeah, I don't charge for stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. So yeah. going back to your community piece, excellent, really, really cool. <laughs> um, and it reminds me of some of the things that that Forge typically talks about, which is like, you know, at being kind and and creating community. They don't, it doesn't cost money, and we can all be part of that. So I really love that. That's, you know, it's an alternative to to those systems, which is fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'm seeing some other questions in here about like, do you do consultations and yeah. all that good stuff? Um, if I, if I said with the alternatives to suicide group info, um, just my contact information, does that work for folks? You can get, I do do consultation and you can absolutely follow up with me. Woohoo. Okay. And then do you do consultations with nonprofits yep. around what you've talked about? Yep. Cool. Excellent. Um, Jess, we didn't, I didn't know what, what was going to happen tonight. Um, and, <laughs> because I just trusted that, you know, you would, you would just make magic and you did. So <laughs> thank you for making something that was beyond what I could have possibly imagined for, for sharing with people. So it's, um, I, and I'm seeing that there's so much excitement from, from those who have added to the chat. So thank you so much for, um, sharing and being and knowing and all of those good things. Thank you for having me. This was really fun for me. I, I love talking about this stuff and especially in, uh, it's important to me in queer community to talk about this, so. It totally is. Um, so it sounds like you're gonna send a couple things to me and then I will send the, those things out to everybody yeah. um, and we'll post the recording of this. Um, and just let me do one piece of housekeeping, which is um, the next two events that we have coming up. Um, the next one is a therapist panel. So it's it kind of relates to your vetting, you know, like the, the kind of concept of vetting. We like to do therapist panels. We haven't done them for a while, but to let people get to see who those therapists are before they invest any money in them and get to ask questions. So that's coming up at April um, 5th. And then Sassafras Lowry, who many of you know is an award-winning um, writer and she's just fantastic, um, is going to do a workshop on art journaling and possibly a little bit on bullet journaling on April 19th. So those are the next two things that are coming up. Um, and I encourage everybody to, to join us. We'll have ASL and um, auto captioning and all of those good things. So just thank you for making time tonight and thank you to our ASL people who are always wonderful and thank you everybody that that joined in tonight and had such um, great attention and great questions and Shelly's going to drop a evaluation in the in the chat for everybody thanks everybody for being here yes you're just fantastic thank you thank you